So hello and welcome to the Fund Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Kamaljit, a uh, financial analyst here at Daniel Financial. Uh, today, I have two wonderful guests with me from Bailey Gifford, uh, Jake Halliday, the Client Service Manager, and Andrew Keeler, the Investment Specialist for the Asia X Japan Strategy. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for taking the time to be a part of this. Uh, we very much appreciate you coming here. Um, so let's just jump right in, um, and why don't you give us a bit of background on who Bailey Gifford is uh, for our audience that are aren't quite familiar with the name. Sure, well, well thanks very much for having us. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so Bailey Gifford as a firm is over a century old, and I think for a firm of our size and tenure, we're actually very simple in that the, ma- the vast majority of our business is managing long-only equity portfolios for our clients. Our ownership structure is absolutely vital to the way that we operate. So. All of the owners of Bailey Gifford work in the business with unlimited liability in a partnership. So there's no question there's a huge line of interest between us and our clients. And that also means no short-term growth targets and a genuinely long-term approach. Now, I'm sure plenty of investment firms tell you they're long-term and that they want to exploit short-term market behavior. But for us, there is proof in the pudding we're quite open in saying we've got nothing to add to the millions of short-term market predictions out there. Our internal reward structures for PMs are focused on five-year investment returns that are delivered for clients. Our client portfolio turnover tends to average 20% or often much less. And it's very common to see a client portfolio where the majority of positions have been held for well over five years. Our our, our main aim is obviously long-term outperformance for our clients. But we think that having long-term relationships with the companies that we're investing in for them is a great way to help us do that. We hopefully have a reputation as supportive shareholders, uh, as a firm who companies want to have on their share registers. Uh, And we do get good access to company founders across Asia, often before they list on public markets. Um, And I don't think short-term traders can can boast the same. We do understand the long-term ambitions of the companies we're investing in and the industries around them. And we hope that makes us better at what we do. Uh, I could go on, but, but hopefully that gives you a flavor. No, definitely. I think that uh, gives a nice background about, you know, Bailey Gifford and, and what they've been doing so far. So, so what's with this Asia X Japan strategy that you have? You know, you know we as a firm here at Dunwell, we've been looking at the region for quite some time now. And, you know, there's some fascinating developments going on over there in recent months especially with the trends that we're beginning to see, you know, with COVID and stuff. Sure, yeah. So Asia as Japan is an important strategy for Bailey Gifford. If I, I go back to 1989, that's when it started. And actually, if you look across the universe of, of Asia as Japan portfolios, there are very few that have been around for this long. Um, it's a strategy that's run out of our emerging markets team um, and one that we have a long track record in doing and the fact that it's it's something that we've done for a long time is important because it means we've been through many crises in the past the asian financial crisis the dot-com boom and bust the gfc and now covid now we're certainly not trying to say that every crisis is the same but hopefully crises do teach you key behavioral lessons um, along the way and for us it's very simple it's about sticking to your guns it's about sticking to a tried and tested investment approach and so in in recent times we've been doing exactly the same as we we always do we've been trying to find businesses that we can invest in for our clients over the long term you've not seen a spike in portfolio turnover you've not seen a deviation from the philosophy and process and certainly shouldn't expect to see that going forward either Mm -hmm. no definitely it's 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 a very interesting strategy that you you know that you guys went over there so one of the questions that a lot of our, our clients sort of tend to ask is, uh, you know, especially with China and some of the structures there with some of the firms, you know, transparency sometimes in, isn't always at the forefront for, for some of these firms, given how they're structured. So are there certain sectors that we should be avoiding and, and other sectors that we should be looking for, especially when it comes to sort of the China region? Absolutely. You know, we're very clear that there are far more Chinese companies that are poorly run than that are good long-term investment opportunities. I'd say over the long term, we'd expect China to follow the model of other more developed markets, whereby it's actually only a few companies that really matter in driving long-term returns. 
And we've certainly seen that in emerging Asia more broadly over the last decade or so. If I look at MSCI Asia X Japan in the last 10 years, only about 6% of companies made up the full return. The other 94% netted off to zero. So for us, it's absolutely about being selective in Asia and in China specifically. Um, of course, we want to avoid the, the duds, but for us, it's actually more important that we manage to find the best companies. And in that context, we focus much more on the upside in our research, uh, identifying, trying to identify the multi-baggers. And to do so, we need to accept that we're going to get some wrong along the way. So, you know, are there certain sectors we should avoid? Maybe, but maybe not. We don't think sector definitions are, are actually particularly helpful. So, so let's be honest, you, you can find a, an advertising business, a retailer, a semiconductor design company, a factory equipment maker, all defined in the same sector. For us, sectors don't matter too much. It's about individual companies. They matter much more for, for our specific investment approach. And there we would say there are some characteristics you can look for, which are common to a lot of great companies in Asia. So what we're asking is whether a company can grow its earnings into the future. So we need to consider things like, does it have a sustainable competitive advantage to allow it to do so? Are the management team likely to execute on the opportunity they, they have? For instance, what's their capital allocation track record like? How is the addressable market going to evolve? Questions like this, these are the sorts of things we think about in sufficient depth before making any investment in a company, whether that's in Asia or, or in China more specifically. So very much a hands-on approach. Um, so then I, I guess that leads to my next question is, um, you know, especially in these times, why is Asia and, and maybe particularly China interesting, uh, you know, with this fund? Yeah, and, and for the first thing I do is acknowledge that I'm, I'm obviously biased in answering this question, but <laughs> I genuinely think that Asia is the best term, best long term opportunity available to growth investors. If we think about the last 30 years that, that we've been managing this, it's come an incredibly long way in its emergence. So now it's home to more than half the world's population, two, thir two thirds of the world's largest cities. And I think the best thing from an investment point of view is that you, you get opportunities that you simply don't get elsewhere in the world. So to give you a few examples, we've been discussing e-commerce in Indonesia recently. This was a $7 billion market a couple of years ago, but by 2025, we can quite easily see the path to $100 billion. Or, or think about India. Fairly recently, India has become the world's largest 4G mobile market by data volume. And that's effectively from a zero start five years ago. There are great early stage opportunities in Asia, which will be huge for the companies involved and will bring massive social benefits to Asian consumers along the way. So for us, it's, it's tremendously exciting. Um, if I think about China, we're just so early through the monetization opportunity for so many great companies. So we've been discussing cloud computing a lot recently. T today, about 40% of data centers in the world are in the US. Only 10% are in China. But China already has about three times the number of internet users than the US does. And the per user data consumption is much, much higher as well because of the, the intensive use of videos and games. So to me, that has to mean a massive opportunity for companies across the cloud computing supply chain in China. Um, so hopefully it's clear we're not really struggling for great ideas. We've got a number of well-trusted independent research partners that we work with and they supplement our own work on Chinese companies. And, and today we've got about $45 billion invested in Chinese companies as a firm. So I would suggest that a dedicated allocation to China or to Asia more broadly in a bigger equity portfolio is likely to become much more commonplace in the next decade. And, and for us, obviously, that, that's really exciting. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. I mean, we've discussed sort of the strategic level and you know, some of the strategies employed by Bailey Gifford. Um, you know, however, it would be somewhat of a disservice not to include um, you know, a, bit, a mention about the Chinese Yuan, uh, especially given its recent movements. I mean, we've had you know, an almost 5% uh, strengthening in that, which you, know, you could almost say it's, it's a direct correlation of the dollar decline. And, you know, we've seen that dollar decline play out in real time. Um, 
So in a global context, a weaker dollar has always been quite favorable to emerging markets and you know, particularly the Asian sector, uh, Asian region. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? Just if I could get a few words. Sure, I think the direction of travel is likely to continue to be towards inflows into Chinese assets more broadly. And that's likely to be supportive for the, the Chinese currency. Um, we don't have a particular view on what's happened recently on, on the near term 5% move, but I think over the very long term, we're going to see structural deployment of capital towards China. If I look at global portfolios today, only about 2.5% of global portfolio allocations are towards China. To me, that feels like a massive anomaly. China is one of the few countries that's going to grow this year. Um, China already contributes you know, around 20% to global GDP growth, if not more. So it feels massively underrepresented in investor portfolios. And that inflow of capital surely has to be positive uh, for, for the Chinese currency going forward. China clearly has ambitions to make the RMB a, a more broadly traded currency and, and will will make a lot of policy moves in the next decade and beyond to try and make sure that's the case. So for us over the long term, that this is likely to be supportive rather than something that detracts away from the, the attractiveness of, of Chinese companies and you know, our investments there. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, you know, the size of the global markets, uh, you know, compared to the segment that China sort of occupies at the moment is, is definitely an interesting point. And, you know, that's something Brian will probably discuss in our next episode in the economic update.